Hello! Today I thought I'd do something a bit different. After over 15 years of Spore and me having never successfully completed the full game, who better to ask and answer the question of whether or not the worst possible carnivore could make it from creation to the center of the universe? For the unfamiliar, Spore is a game about progress. It's about evolution. Starting as a lowly microscopic organism, I'll one day have to traverse the stars in search of enlightenment. For now though, I must seek food in the form of the fallen, the less capable. While this won't be my final form, it is how we must start, as the game doesn't allow you to immediately customize your creature. As a result of that, and me not paying attention, I did inadvertently cheat by continuing to eat too much, and had to restart from the beginning. At least it was early on. Much sooner this time, I would start by removing my means of propulsion and vision. I would reduce the overall size of my creature to make it less imposing, and most importantly, I would move its mouth to its rear. This would immediately make things like eating significantly harder. Without a means of pushing myself toward food, or food toward me, I'd be helpless to try to consume something while the hostile denizens of the primordial soup that I call home would cost me at any given turn. At first, I hoped that they could propel me into food. I could deflect some of their attacks with my mouth, gaining relatively tremendous speed, but to no avail. I was lost, blind, alone in an ocean of problems, and I... I was one of them. Set adrift, I found that traveling with the gentle current made my travel at least a bit faster. Travel to where? An excellent question, without an answer. I was eventually able to locate a morsel of what I identified as food, something my ancestors before me enjoyed for sustenance, but I would take on as a puzzle. I would squirm and thrash helplessly, hoping that by some miracle it would find its way into my waiting mouth. So tauntingly close, so tantalizingly near, but without even needing to subject itself to the indignity of locomotion, it evaded me all the same. Was this it? Was my fate to forever know the feeling of coming just within reach of its delicious embrace only for it to elude me? No, this was not to be. Through a series of movements that were peculiar, and even alien to this planet, I was able to consume the first DNA since the species' transformation, and proof that it could be done. After a celebratory dance, I set back out with renewed hope and reaffirmed purpose. I would continue honing my craft, making my way through the world on scraps as I hadn't a hope of hunting. All of my potential prey moved faster than I so subsisting on what stronger predators would leave behind would prove to be my niche. They say it's the strong that survive, but this is false. It remains true to this day that the adaptable survive where the strong may perish. By accepting the role that I've been given, I've already proven my superiority to they, even where my determination may prove otherwise inconsequential in the wake of their might. The game would often spawn me in the near vicinity of food, a gift that I wouldn't spurn, though it also often spawned me right next to more capable predators, meaning life was both dangerous and often rather brief. I was frequently left helpless as something else would devour my meal, though I may still avoid becoming theirs, merely surviving wasn't enough in this ecosystem. I would have to thrive and grow to one day escape the confines of the waters. The denizens of the deep, though, were ruthless in both design and action. As I learned and grew, so too did they become more numerous, dangerous, and overall aggressive. With I no speed to speak of, I'd more often than not find myself to be a proverbial bit of dust within a wind that my skin had never known going wherever the predators or current would choose for me to go, always hoping and searching for my next meal. Many of us would perish long before we could complete our search. Countless generations consumed before they could even have the tiniest of morsels for themselves. And yet the next generation was fueled and filled by the same hope as those that came before them. Rare as it was, there were instances where a hunter would all but forget their meal entirely, leaving a bounty of scraps for me to behold. Whether or not I would get the chance to eat my fill was another discussion entirely. As I grew larger, so too did the swarms of aggressive species. With them came a nagging feeling. I was able to survive far better than I'd imagined, and having not played Spore in a good many years, I didn't remember the limits of the creator at any stage of the game, let alone this one. I had a voice at the back of my mind wondering if my creature could be made worse. Was this not good enough, or rather, too good? As a horde of creatures gnawed at my not yet developed bones, and giants faced death just for a taste of my soft and supple flesh. I made a decision that would shape the future of this run, and a decent chunk of my time. I would restart. This time my mouth was smaller. It seemed marginally less effective for defending myself, and it made the act of simply eating significantly harder. This was the correct form. My struggling evolved into gently caressing my meal, holding it in my lukewarm embrace, hopeful that it would work its way into my awaiting maw. Little did I know that I was turning in the wrong direction. Though it felt counterintuitive, simply rejecting my food would bring it to me sooner, but this did mark the infancy of the new species. Far more sure this time, the worst possible carnivore. Now more practiced in the monumental task of e eating. I would work my way up the food chain, bit by bit, though I would often find myself at its mercy, bite by bite. Retreading the same paths and currents through the seemingly endless void that those before me partook in, I squirmed and chewed my way through the unenviable task of growing. 
Though inferior to its predecessor, the species moved with a purpose and determination to live that I hadn't seen before. Rare as it may be, there are creatures that spit in the face of evolution, favoring life by sheer determination. And though it may be the worst carnivore, it proved to be the best species the planet has to offer, even if it meant erasing every other to reach such a goal by default. The final phase of the cell stage has you attacked by a swarm of small creatures that are all fully capable of killing you, but provide little more than sustenance. Somehow they're completely absent of DNA to provide a growing species. And while they can't consume the morsels that drive me, they're very capable of pulling away the pieces that I need to be whole. I would face many deaths, from humiliating to comical. Even still, my trial by fire would slowly come to a close as my creatures formed the first signs of brain activity. At the same time, though, I would find that all I had witnessed before were sparks, and the inferno yet laid before me. After 127 deaths in this world alone, I felt it was only right to further reduce the size and general viability of my species upon land. With only two vertebrae, it wouldn't even live with the dignity of looking snake-like, as those are still capable of freaking some people out. While I can't count myself among them, intimidation is a powerful tool that we wouldn't be able to make use of. It's not actually a gameplay mechanic, I just wanted to make them smaller. Emerging from the waters, our angry jellybean-looking creatures would be tasked with either befriending or murdering all that lay before us, all while only being able to see in monotones and in a really small circle. I would locomote via aggressively scooting along the ground toward my potential friend or food, all the while tactically editing around a series of flashing images that would occur any time a new creature came within proximity of me because OBS really didn't like Spore in particular. I had to change around how I recorded entirely to not assault my own senses with lights and colors. Fitting, I suppose, as I sang in tandem with these foreign creatures. We sang in tones I couldn't even begin to imagine because I lack ears. Instead favoring merely feeling the vibes and jamming out into the soundless void of my head. It was enough for them though, and I was soon able to befriend enough that I received a DNA bonus for my radical new sounds, an early contribution to the arts. Though my attempts at friendship were earnest, they also were deemed unworthy of a returned affection. My new potential allies wanted to dance, and though I had no arms or legs to join them, I sang a joyous tune to move to. Still, they were unimpressed. Unamused. I simply wasn't good enough for them. I've spent far too long bending over backwards, sacrificing my needs for the wants of others. Now things will be different. If they don't want my friendship, then I need bloodshed. Have at thee, foul creature! Face your death with honor! Meet glory upon the battlefield! Drat! An ineffectual first killing, but there will be more. Though I was unable to kill, my bloodthirst has only just begun. My dull songs of the day to come would ring throughout the air as I worked my way toward advancing my species. The creatures I befriended knew not of my coming conquest, but they would be pivotal in its execution. For with their friendship, I was able to bring a second in command a partner in crime, a duplicate in the worst carnivorous species this planet would ever know. As I would level up, so too would the planet around me, giving more dangerous creatures to contend with. Though our bites and songs would grow no stronger, with there being more of us, we had more health to chew through. And so a strategy would immediately be born. Having spent the formative years of our species outnumbered, the path forward would be clear. I would throw myself into the center of a hostile environment and take on all who would attempt to combat me. Damn it! I can't possibly see why that wouldn't have worked. Mostly because I lack eyes. Changing things up slightly, I'd take on a far more manageable species with a much smaller quantity to contend with. Though this would still lead to death, it would come out as a net positive. I was more than happy with even a single kill, regardless of the loss of life on our part. What we lacked in survivability, damage, and basically everything else we more than made up for in having literally an endless supply of us to throw at any given problem. Currently only two of us at a time, but two was more than enough. Kind of. Things get really dangerous in this stage of things. And those things would be me. I would be dangerous. With the help of a small horde, of course. This game being a lot buggier than I remember, I would sometimes simply get stuck in the train. Getting out was... trying. While we struggled in larger encounters, a single mighty roar from the party's leader was enough to send even the bravest of species running, significantly raising their chances in any given scuffle. It being on a significant cooldown, though, this would only prove helpful sometimes. For reasons that are beyond me, the eggs of the species are several times the size of the creatures themselves. How and why, I have no idea. Now, among my travels and my many, many deaths, this game would crash all the time. And, and I mean all the time. Every time I died, my heart would stop for a moment as I looked onto an empty screen hoping that it would actually fill back out because there was a high likelihood that it wouldn't. This led to nearly constant saving because a lot of progress was lost to the game's instability. I would invite many new species to be our friends, and many times more we were rejected. 
With no other recourse, I was forced to subject various creatures of different shapes and sizes to a series of headbutts so hard that I was able to bite them through the entire mass of my creature's admittedly small and unassuming form. My group having moved on without me though, I had to figure out how to regroup with them. Food was running scarce, which is to say we didn't have any food, the journey was long, and I hadn't feet to reach our destination. After what felt like an eternity, and with just the slightest slivers of sustenance clinging to my bones, much like the depressed craters of malnourished flesh that topped my withered form, I made it home. Of all the concerns I had for this stage, traversing point A to B was not among them, but a fear of it had been stricken within me. Of the other dangers of this world, there were those that would capitalize on our lack of vision. After wandering too far into enemy territory, they would pounce. And once the swarming began, there was nothing I could do to even comfort my compatriots with my dying breaths, for they hadn't the ears to hear me grateful for their loyalty until the end. Nor had I, to hear their last screams as they were torn apart. Perhaps this was a hollow comfort. As cruel as it was, it was a simple life. Beset upon by all manner of beasts, ours was to slowly bite our way up the food chain, with no heed to our safety, no time to slow down and savor the flavors of life. All we could taste was death. This was largely due to the lack of taste buds, as our species didn't have the luxury of evolving to experience the world around us through anything but pain. Pain and blood. While there are those that are against causing trouble at home, the worst possible carnivore would do almost nothing but. With deaths being common, the best prey was almost exclusively right next to home. This made the treks back home to restock on sacred friends considerably faster. After retrieving more of our kind, we'd make our way back for more food, to varying effect. It was a slow life that we led, but it was an effective life. As we made our way into the strongest form of our animalistic stage, we reached a total of four possible specimens within a grouping. When possible, our kind would feast upon the eggs of less determined creatures, as to harvest as much DNA as possible from the denizens of the planet. When all else failed, we would exploit the fearful nature of children. The babies of species would flee at the first sign of danger without the presence of their developmental betters. Without a direction to go, they would of course return home, where we would be waiting to feast upon their precious DNA points. All for progress. All for progress. Trying to get to our new home was akin to running across a war zone, as the culmination of hours of pissing off local wildlife came to a head in the form of several species and even an epic monster. Otherwise surrounded and low on both health and food, I tried the best that I could to thread the needle between those hostile beings, ultimately to little success. I grew concerned that the trek would become impossible rather quickly, food is a commodity that I often wouldn't be able to reach. With only one ally spawning with me, killing enemies and or using my compatriots as bait while I tried to slip by both proved ineffectual. I would have to take a much wider berth around the creatures of the planet, which could prove disastrous. Fortunately, those that I found along the way were at least relatively neutral to my existence. Now housed closely to waters, we were in a prime position for the next stage of our development, but with so much left to go. There were few things better than when a meal would deliver themselves to our proverbial doorstep. While being attacked at home would usually be regarded as a disaster for any normal species, ours was anything but. Not limited to merely traveling companions to combat foes attacking us within our own turf, we would swarm like never before. Shortly thereafter, they would lie dead, and our stomachs would be full. Our surviving neighbors would be both hostile and fast. Fighting them one-on-one -on -one was a rare event, and due to the AI pathing, there would often be one or more of us simply not engaging in the fray, and any damage we're not dealing is damage we'd never get a chance to do, usually due to excess casualties, often punctuated by the game crashing reversing whatever progress I did manage. The remainder of the creature stage was almost entirely luring creatures back to our nest, where we would brutally headbutt their shins until even giants would fall. It wasn't the best way, but it was our way. We would eventually, though, grow smarter, more civilized. Welcome to the tribal stage. Here, our aggressive tendencies would be met with death and only death. As the first stage with a true fail state, I would have to both save and play extremely carefully as to not render my save unwinnable. Throughout the tribal stage, more tribes of various species will spawn into the world. Most of them dislike us enough to openly steal our food and or attack us given the opportunity. Should they choose to attack us, we have no real means of defending ourselves. We're simply too weak. The collection of food in general is slow and difficult. While I understood that fishing was the best way I could collect food, I didn't yet understand that I could fish even without tools to do so. It's less efficient, sure, but it's better than the alternative that is hunting. Additionally, I'm not sure if my species has anything to do with it specifically, but they're extremely slow to put away any and all collected food into our storage, which made things go even slower. They had some more problems with collecting tools and doing pretty much everything else. It was as if they just didn't know what to do when faced with anything. The beginning of the stage was a mad dash to collect as much food as I could manage, as the rival tribes attacking meant death was more or less guaranteed. I needed the food to create more children. I needed those children to collect food. I needed food to pay for new buildings and to bribe the other tribes into tolerating us long enough to not die. 
This would still prove ineffectual without a bit of shenanigans. Using the baby duplication glitch, I was able to fill out our ranks and reach toward a better state of being. Given the option, and our lack of combative capabilities, I elected to try my hand at the peaceful route, despite the fact that wild animals come to steal my food anytime the tribe is out for approximately half a nanosecond. When you befriend or eliminate a group, the next set will spawn in. I had to restart the stage a fair few times, eventually coming to the conclusion that waiting things out and just stockpiling food would be the way to go. Unfortunately, if you wait too long, they'll spawn in anyway, and while I was sat upon a healthy supply, I had saved after making the dire mistake of simply waiting for too long. Of every gambit I would attempt during my testing, I thought surely an epic attacking my enemy at the same time as I would send my entire tribe into combat would be a decisive victory. The world is full of brutality and struggles. The wildlife is monstrously dangerous. What I hadn't accounted for is that all bets are off when considering the danger involved to my foes. The epic would spend most of its time simply looking into the void, contemplating life itself, and as it did this, the void would stare back. It was clear that violence would not be the answer. At least not yet. While gift giving was the fastest track to neutrality, our inferior speed made things... trying. The creatures of Spore are fickle and would often raise conflict over anything and everything, including simply the passage of time. We would send our gift baskets begging for mercy, but our messengers would come slow, and the raids would come fast. As soon as we could stabilize between the wildlife, raiders, and just reaching a yellow face on the continental scale, we had to reach grand enough stores to bribe the peoples of the land not to kill us while we played our hearts out in hopes that they could find our antics amusing enough for peace. The next move would of course be to convert them to permanent friends with the coveted green smiley face. This though would prove strangely impossible. Even with perfect performances, our musical prowess was just not grand enough. Without ears to receive feedback, we knew not why they loathed our performance, but there was nothing we could do to change it. We tried playing for the full tribe, we tried playing for a singular member, it was always the same. And though we could mildly wow everyone, we could truly befriend almost no one. With more to come, and more to fear, the path of course would become clear. Those who make jolly cooperation impossible make violent eradication inevitable. Slowly we would descend upon the opposing tribes. Beset by a small legion of gnashing mandibles all wielding axes, somehow, we would thrash and whack at their home base. And while they'd tear at our numbers, they could do nothing to tear at our spirit. They would watch helplessly as we broke down not just what they created, but what they are. As we perished, we did so knowing that more would take our place. Relentless. And when they took ours, we would take theirs within the world, spreading our influence further as we would appropriate their technologies as our own, making us more capable in new walks of life and ready to face the remaining tribes. We would trade our axes for spears, one of the most effective melee weapons throughout history. While we hadn't the arms to extend our reach, we would have long-pointed sticks, the Green Tribe would greet us as friends, but they spurned our attempts at revelry. Now they will burn in our attempts at world domination. Somehow by holding the long pointed sticks our movement speed was greatly increased, and we became far more capable hunters. Able to traverse long and far at speeds previously unimaginable by our kind, it made us harder to hit, able to attack our foes from a relatively long distance. It made us more survivable, and for the first time it made us formidable. Though the battle was long, so too was our victory. Lasting forevermore, we would reign dominant as their memories would fade to little more than ashes drifting in the wind. The final tribes would come in swinging, angered by our existence. A dangerous state to be in, just unable to afford their hand in friendship. We worked tirelessly to afford a peace treaty, hoping desperately to be able to afford their affections. We were unable to dissuade them before they could attack, but in the midst of their siege, our gifts would be able to reach their door, and news of our newfound deal reached their warriors in time for our humble village to remain intact. We duplicated more children as to create workers for their efforts fueling their advancements for our own nefarious purposes. An easy enough task, though a costly one with our reserves already running so low. We had to work swiftly before the tides could be given a chance to change once more. Our leaders may creep slowly, but they carry a very sizable stick. We would construct the last of our instruments, taking up arms not for war, but for hugs. Along the way, we would find not one, but two epic creatures in the way between our homes. Our first attempt at song would be cut short before it could even begin, with our denizens being picked off one by one and the tribe leader for some reason refusing to conduct song under these conditions. We instead went over the other tribe at our residence when they came by to give us gifts for being all around okay folks to not start wars with. We agreed and recruited them as permanent friends. The deal was struck, now and forevermore. No takesies backsies. For our last friend, we'd have to take a long and arduous journey across the world, going to literally great lengths to avoid conflict with the exceptionally oversized wildlife, eventually ending out the tribal stage in a concert fueled by desperation, starvation, and frankly, things just kinda going not so smoothly throughout. But any journey you can wriggle away from is a journey that we could conquer. The greatest minds among us came to the conclusion that indoor plumbing was pretty neat, so we should probably invent doors so we could put plumbing in them. We erected buildings and built cars in our image, a series of tubes with no rhyme or reason to their layout. 
They may have been eyesores, but that was everyone else's problem to deal with because we had not been born with such weaknesses. Given the shape of our vehicles, though, they weren't particularly aerodynamic. They couldn't outpace the speedsters of the other civilizations, and try as we might, we just couldn't make it to any of the opposing spice geysers in time. All of them were claimed long before we could reach them, and we were left with little more than our home city to produce currency that we would use to further develop our home and military. The civilization stage can similarly be failed, and I would restart it multiple times over to try different tactics, but one truth remained throughout. We were broke. Increasingly, unfortunately, our one hope of salvation was to just pay the opposing civilizations to like us. They were rather vain and materialistic, which meant groveling at their feet with compliments and monetary gifts earned a ceasefire from all around us. It left us with very little funding, which we poured into making our city better. Though it was economically sound, it provided us with very little political or military strength. Our vehicles just weren't advanced enough to pose a threat to any military other than our own. An unfortunate state of affairs, to be sure. My understanding of the civilization stage would be my undoing, as I didn't know how I would go about doing things. Despite mostly making peace with the tribes of the previous stage, I was forced into a military city with no real affinity for conflict. Paying money hand over fist for friendship, I would instead just pay other military leaders to fight our battles for us. A sound strategy, except while they would conquer cities with ease, it was in their own name. Before long, there remained only two factions, our strained associates and our own. Without any means by which to meaningfully combat or befriend them, I needed a way out. I had already maxed out the amount of friendship score they could be earned by paying them, and despite their religious backing, they were too robust to be bowled over with aggressive tactics. Given the hopelessness of the situation, I thought I would try anyway. Go down fighting, as it were. They didn't seem as though they would attack, but choosing to do nothing wouldn't let me win, either. So I instead marched my incredibly slow combat vehicles to their door. We didn't have power, but we had money, and any car that they would destroy, we could replace. It took a while, but we were able to rip their home away from their cold, dead hands, and it turns out that we had paid them so much that they still didn't want a war with us. Out of the jaws of defeat, we had snatched a spark of hope. A potential victory, even. By them owning so many cities around us, they got increasingly upset that our borders were near the ones that they set. A problem of their own creation, but by taking their cities, we actually seemed to lower that negative modifier, meaning we could maybe keep somewhere in equilibrium long enough to take over the world. Thinking that mayhap using their own tactics against them could bear more fruit, I converted one of the Taken territories into a religious city. This would be my undoing, as despite them taking over every other city on the entire planet by way of forcing their religion onto the citizens, us introducing our own beliefs to them was a bridge too far, and they declared war on the spot. Bombs and guns were fine, but Space God was not. We were helpless to fight back, and at that moment, I was left with no choice but to reset. Having read up on how the conversion of cities works, I learned that to defeat the enemy passively, I must simply buy the enemy passively. Something that I thought I could accomplish, but what I learned required first an economic city. So this time, about as quickly as I could manage, I attacked an economic city to use for my own purposes. They were powerless to fight back, despite us only being able to afford a small handful of units due to having to constantly pour our military budget into keeping the orange civilization from wiping us off the face of the planet. It was incredibly slow going due to how weak our vehicles still were, but going it was. After some time, it was ours. The first order of business was of course to turn it into a money-making powerhouse. Something that we could only kind of do, but we would use the funds it produced to buy friendship, much like before. Unfortunately though, we couldn't buy it fast enough. The orange civilization loathed us for a few reasons, all mostly being entirely out of our control. Before long, they declared war no matter how much money we shoveled their way. They were attacking my home city with the ferocity of a lot of really pissed off dudes. Which is when I hatched a brilliant strategy. I would just give it to them. By selling off all of our assets, I could recoup half of the funds I'd spent on improving it, all while making it easier for them to conquer. If they hated me for my success, then I would just be unsuccessful. Anything and everything to be as unimposing as possible. They can't hate me if I sacrifice everything we have to making them love us. The plan was even working. As soon as our home finished burning to the ground, they became neutral to our existence. Mistake on their part, really. We forged peace deals and trade routes with anyone and everyone who would be kind to us. It would help us economically, and we would give those funds to any civilization we believed would come out on top. Betting on who the victor of this seemingly endless war would be, all the while staying out of it entirely. We were just as imposing on the sidelines or on the battlefield, so why partake at all? By a peaceful to us group taking over the planet, they were only succeeding in narrowing potential threats to our way of life. Though we tried countless times throughout the age of the Orange Nation's reign, they denied us repeatedly any attempts to trade with them the last thing we needed to begin coming back from our current, humiliating state of being. When there was next to nobody left to turn to, they demanded our loyalty. Though we dared not earn their ire, we detested the concept of infuriating the other civilizations. 
for we'd be just as powerless as to defeat them in any conflict. So I instead paused the game, man, unpaused, and then just opened up communication with any Civ that wasn't mine to sidestep their demands without any repercussions. An exceedingly useful tool in our path to global domination. We would sit by and watch passively as all of our allies, all of our acquaintances, would fall before the might of Orange. After funneling countless war bucks into their coffers, we eventually managed a true friendship, one born of desperation, but they didn't need to know that. We built trade routes, which further helped our relations. When the time came and the funds were plentiful enough, we legally purchased one of their cities for a fraction of what we'd already given them. A task we would replicate, slowly, as our trade was anything but quick. We would even purchase a city from our newfound friends in the midst of it being destroyed by an epic. A generous offer, really. With our expanding task force of salespeople ready and willing, we received an offer we couldn't refuse from the Orange Nation. Having purchased enough of their homes out from under them, and grown close enough by way of economics, they offered to join forces, thus bringing a near instant end to the civilization stage. A bit of a surprise, to be honest, but a welcome one, as we'd once again proven victorious despite never even having built a plane. Much more complicated than flight, though, would be space flight, and that's exactly where we were headed. We were forced to go scan some things at the beginning of the space stage, mostly just to unlock trading with our own colony. With that done, I got to work in using the trading menu to duplicate rich and valuable spices that I would trade to other civilizations for spore bucks. Spore bucks that I would turn into upgrades that would allow my ship to travel farther and faster through space. A necessary upgrade if I wanted to reach the center of the galaxy, the one and only goal that remained for the worst possible carnivore. With our fuel reserves so low, flying any distance was difficult and dangerous, eventually causing the ship to expire in glorious fashion. By hitting Control s just before detonation though, the game would save that the ship had been destroyed. By quitting out and loading back in, I would trigger the ghost ship glitch, which would allow me to travel with no health or energy as long as I want, meaning the space stage was by far the shortest and easiest stage. I did this for one simple reason. I don't like the space stage. But while my lack of ships stumbles through the cosmos on my way to the center of our existence, I'd like to thank my lovely channel members for your support, much like a guiding star in the infinite expanse. Your kindness is a beacon that thankfully won't send me notifications that we're being raided while I'm several systems away. Who thought that was a good idea for a gameplay mechanic? I've got other things to do. Regardless of who you are though, I hope you enjoyed your time here. You probably know how to use social media, and I hope that means I'll get to hear your thoughts now and any future outings. Until then, remember to stay safe, spread some kindness in the world, and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.